should have held it today. Go to Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9 and verse 18, Luke chapter 9 verse 18, and we find ourselves this morning uh, on this topic, even when you pass the test, there is still the homework, there is still the homework, and that song fits right in about taking up our cross. Let's see what Jesus says, and then we'll dive into this this morning. Verse 18 And it came about that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Who do the multitudes say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell anyone saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And as he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is it a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of his Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of these of those standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of of God. You know, a lot of times at weddings, one of the things that I will mention, and it's funny because I was looking at some notes and I did this at, Ch- at Chad and Laura's wedding. I mentioned about the three great decisions in life. And the three great decisions in life are life's master, life's mission, and life's mate. We're going to deal with the first two today. We're going to deal with the great decision about life's master, but also about life's mission. Now, we always are facing important decisions. We, we face them all the time. Where will I live? What kind of career will I choose? How will I rear my children? Where will they go to school? I mean, just all of those things. Questions almost define us sometimes as we look at things, and they, they certainly determine the paths of our life. There are things and thoughts that we have as they cross our mind, and they shape us. They shape how we live. You know, if I, I, if I just don't answer out loud, but if I say, you know, wh- what kind of job do you think the president's doing? Or how do you feel that we ought to be handling the terrorists? Or, you know, great questions like, should I throw a white spinner bait or a chartreuse crankbait? You know, these things define where we go and how we feel about things. Questions and their answers are important to our life. They always have been and they always will be. But rising above all inquiries, above everything that crosses your mind and everything that you make a decision about, there is a riding question that burns into the heart of every man and every woman, every boy and every girl. And everything else pales in comparison. It is insignificant about other things if we don't get this one right because it is about eternal life. What do you think about Jesus Christ? What do you think about him? That is the exam. That is the test. Let's see what Jesus said about it. Let's look about in this way. We're going to put the examination. Who is Jesus? And I will define this as the question that will be answered. I don't don't say it must be answered or you need to answer it. It will be answered. In life or in judgment, you will issue forth your answer to this question. You cannot avoid it. It cannot be something you push away. You can't say, well, I don't want to take that test. You will take the test. You will answer this question, who is Jesus? What do you think about him? Let's talk first about what this question is not because people get confused with this. They, they, they have an idea when I say that, and they, I, it, the question is not, what do you think about the church? That is not it. Put in your notes, it's not the church. What do you think about the preacher? 
or the temperature in here this morning, or the comfort of the pews, or the color scheme that we picked out, or the painting on the walls, or whether we take up Operation What do you think about the church? See, some people get that confused. It's not, what do you think about the representatives? <laughs> you know, we all have folks that we've known in churches, we don't think much of them, Right? That's not the question. It is not a question of, 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 of pretenders or bad witnesses. and You can't hide behind a hypocrite. It is not a question about how do you feel about the doctrine. being what, How do you feel about denominations and who's right and who's wrong. And you can get, see, here are, here's the thing. We get, we get in the weeds with things like that. I'm trying to draw you back to the question that Jesus looked at his disciples and said, who do you think I am? He begins it, though, with a thinking question. What do others say about me? How do others answer this question? What do the multitudes say about me? Jesus is asking this for the sake of the disciples. He's wanting them to get an idea about their environment. He wants them to understand what is the public perception that is out there. Sometimes we miss this too. We're sitting in the church and we're among believers and we spend so much time among believers. Sometimes we forget how the outside world sees us. Jesus is saying, you need to be aware. Not everybody thinks like you do. Not everybody's looking. You would be surprised how many people in America see the Christian church the same way they see Hamas. Because they have a warped interpretation. So Jesus is trying to say, are you aware of public perception around you? And when he says the multitudes, he's not talking about the people that are against him. He's talking about the people that are following him. When he talks about multitudes, he's talking about the Jews and the, 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 the common folk that have been coming out to see him. They were actively pursuing him. What do they say? He got several answers. He said, well, some say John the Baptist. Herod Antipas felt that way. You're, we saw that last week. He was worried that Jesus was John the Baptist, you know, resurrected. He questioned that. And other people followed in that grain of thought that, that he was there to announce the Messiah's coming. Others said Elijah. Elijah is the great prophet of the Jewish faith. Everybody looks at him. He is the powerhouse, the supreme Old Testament prophet to a Jewish eye and mind. As a matter of fact, in modern day Jewish celebrations, they still leave an empty table, an empty t chair at the table for Elijah. And they are saying, come Elijah to for be the forerunner to the Messiah. It comes from Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Others just said, well, they just think that you're one of the prophets. So I'm a prophet from old, has arisen, he's resurrected, he's walking around. Here's the thing, in every one of those possibilities, in every single one of them, they perceived Jesus to be the front runner, that he was a prophet, that he was a good man, that he spoke for God. But they came up short. They spoke highly of him, but they didn't recognize him as God. They are not the last to do so. Pilate's going to one day say, I find no fault in this man. He doesn't recognize him. Many people have tried to define Jesus without getting it quite right. Napoleon, I saw there's a movie coming out about him and it looks pretty brutal, but I, like might be something I want to see. But Napoleon said, I know men and Jesus is no mere man. The German rationalist Strauss said that he is the highest model of religion. The French atheist Renan said he is the greatest among the sons of men. And of course, the musical said, Jesus Christ, superstar. <laughs> the problem with all of those is they are flirting with the truth. They are not the truth. Some of you in this room flirt with the truth. Even, in, even the fact that you're here today does not dispel that, that in your heart you come up just a little bit short. They all define him as this good person, but they come up short of him being God, of being the Messiah. Why? 
Because if he is a good man, I can admire him from afar. I can read about him. And I can admire the way that he walked and the way that he talked and the way that he loved people and his compassion. But he, if he is the Messiah, if he is the Son of God, I must come to him, I must bow to him, and I must answer to him. So that first question was to get the disciples to think. The second question was to get the disciples to choose. I'm doing the same thing with you, by the way. That first question was to think about it. But this one is different. Jesus makes it personal. Verse 20, but who do you say that I am? So in your notes there, and see what does, put your name, I put Tim. What does Tim say? This is the final exam for every life. Everyone takes this test. You can't avoid it. Some professors and some teachers will let a student exempt an exam. They've done so well. They've turned in their papers. They've done their homework. They've got an A average. They do very well in a class. You don't need to take the test. There are no exemptions from this test. And there are people, though, that still try to do that. They try to live their life so good that then one day God's going to say, well, I know you didn't take me at face value, but you live so good, I'm going to let you in. There's no possibility of that. You must take the test and you must answer the question, who is Jesus Christ? Here is the great news about this quiz. <laughs> we have the correct answer. It is given to us. He gives it to us. The professor's written it on the board, and here is Peter. Here is Peter. He's always the first to speak, isn't he? And I love it. He is brief. He is emphatic. He is disciple, decisive. Who do you think that I am? He said, the Christ of God. Matthew expounds upon that. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wrapped up in that, that great word is Christos. And wrapped up in that word is the relief of Israel. You are the one. All the oppression, all the centuries are being fought against, and we see it still happening, right? All the oppression on them. And wrapped up in that word, Christoph, Peter says, you are the long-awaited deliverer of Israel. You are the supreme anointed one. You are the coming high priest, the coming king, the coming prophet, the coming savior. You are him. You are the man. The one that God has predicted, the one that God has prophesied, the one that God has now provided. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a powerful statement. Powerful statement. But yet we sit here, and Jesus says, well, what do you say? Don't quote what somebody else says. Don't say what the preacher says. Who do you say? Can you honestly say he is the Messiah? He is the one. He, he came from God and is God. He died for my sins, resurrected on the third day, and he is coming back. He has reserved for me a place in heaven, and he is coming back to get me. Do you say that because you heard the preacher say it a thousand times? Or a Sunday school teacher, or your mama, or your daddy? It needs to be something that you confess personally. It's got to be something you profess personally. In the New Testament, people profess this through baptism. Some of you maybe haven't done that. You say you believe in all these things. The strong words in Luke, verse 27, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of his Father and of the angels. Answer the question. But here's the second part of my title, okay? Even after you answer that question, and, and I'm going to leave that, and we'll get back to it at the end, okay? Are you saved? You need to answer that question. But a lot of you are saved. Guess what? Even after we take the test, there's homework, right? There's homework. The expectation, Jesus gets into it right away. He doesn't leave that lay in there. He says, who do you say that I am? He got the right answer, but then he moves. And he says, okay, that's great. But look at this expectation. And he shares the cost of following him. And the first thing he says, 
bad English, good preaching. This ain't going to be easy. This ain't going to be easy. He says in verse 22, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. He says, look, guys, this is what's going to happen to me. And I'm telling you this because you need to hear it. It is not going to be clear sailing. It is not going to be easy. It is not going to be. There are going to be very tough days ahead. And there is not going to be room for compromise or whine or excuses or to back up or retreat. None of that's going to work. I warned you. I'm telling you today. This is not going to be easy. And you need to check your ego at the door. That's the second one. Look at verse 23. And he was saying to all of them, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. Oh my goodness, how that's been so strangely interpreted, okay? To deny yourself does not mean to deny yourself things, okay? Wealth is a great stumbling block. And the Bible tells us time and time again that it can be terrible. And people get lost in it because they begin to lean on their wealth and their their abilities rather than to trust God. But wealth in and of itself is not bad. To have things is not bad. To be poor is not mean that you are spiritual. (laughs) I have had people do that. They feel like in their poverty it adds to their spirituality. That's not what it means to deny yourself. To deny yourself doesn't mean to put on that long face either. Oh my goodness. I remember being a kid in church and I was scared to death of some of the old folks in the church. And I look back at them, I look, you, I look back at them, and some of them, you're your age, Jamie, okay? Some of them were 40 years old. You never out there. Really? They come in, they get that look on their face. You know? You come by and run, and they just look at you like, well. But some people have that mindset. I'm suffering for Jesus. You know? That's the way they I gave up my recliner to be here today. I could be home watching a rerun of True Grit. I, I, you know, I, it just, do you really think all that put on is self-denial? That's not at all. Do you know what Jesus means by self-denial? Checking your ego? It is a total abandonment for God. That's what it is. It's not losing your identity. It is finding your identity. And your identity is in God. The real you that God created you to be with purpose and mission and drive, that is what he's talking about. Mm. Self-denial is not hating yourself either. I've seen this happen a lot of times. People look down on themselves and and think bad of themselves, and they think harshly of the way, that they, and they just try to put their self down, thinking that's spiritual. You know what truly is denying yourself? It's not when you think poorly of yourself, it's when you don't think of yourself at all. Timothy McVeigh. You remember Timothy McVeigh? It's been a long time now. But he was an Oklahoma City bomber, and I've been out there and seen that memorial. It's just unbelievable what the evil that resides in mankind sometimes, and he, he adopted a poem called Invictus. And at the end of that poem, and, you know, a lot of people have this mentality. Now, they don't kill 168 people, but they have, it ends like this. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I got this. I can handle this. I'm in charge here. What a contrast to the life that Jesus says that Jesus shows an unselfish life of serving others and doing good things. This homework's hard, isn't it? You're, I'm talking, he's preaching to believers now. This homework is hard. I need to check my ego, but he doesn't stop there. He says, you also need to uh, die every day. That's the C one in your notes. Die every day. And as he was saying to the to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. This is so simple, and it gets missed so often. A person carrying a cross had only one destination, and it was death. It was death. It was always a one-way trip. Always. For you to carry your cross does not mean that you got one in your pocket or around your neck. 
For you to carry your cross does not mean that you put a large wooden cross on your back and carry it around like I've seen some do, and there's nothing wrong with that, but, but to feel like that's your spirituality is. And I've heard this all of my life. Other people say, well, it's just my cross to bear. Talking about some physical ailment. They got an ingrown toenail or they got a, a, a migraine headache. Well, it's just a cross I have to bear. You listen to me. Jesus isn't talking about a bad hair day. He is not talking about nosy neighbors. He is talking about dying. That's what the cross meant. We don't have the, the real visible things around us like they did in that day. The, the moment Jesus said cross, every one of his listeners knew what he was talking about. And theirs was not an idea of a glossy one with a little diamond in the middle of it. It wasn't one of the fancy ones with the edges around it that's hanging up in the house. It was the stench and the blood and the gruesomeness of death. That's what they had in mind. The Romans would not even mention the cross in polite company. As a matter of fact, it was so barbaric that it was illegal for a Roman citizen to be executed by the cross. When the crowd heard the word cross, they had a word picture come to mind. And they saw a condemned man dragging the cross to his death. Jesus says we're to die to ourselves. We've lost this imagery. We've lost it. We are to die to, to, to wholly give ourselves to Jesus Christ. To come to Christ for salvation is not that you raise your hand with every head bowed. It's not that you complete a card on the front of bench. It is not that you even go through these waters. It's not to join a church. It is to take up your cross. To end yourself and to live for Christ. A cross around your neck is no substitute for a cross on your back. Let me tell you something about a person on a cross. Number one, just, just three, three, a, a, a man on a cross, a woman on a cross, they have no plans of their own. They have no plans of their own. A person on a cross is facing one direction, and a person on the cross must be prepared to die. When you take on the cross that Jesus talks about here, those are the things that you need to come to your mind. That my plans is not that we don't plan. God tells us we should plan, but that I don't make those up. That I go to God and I look for direction. In other words, I'm not serving myself with everything in my life. That there is something about serving the Lord that's a part of my life. That I have one direction. I want to serve Him and His kingdom. And that I'm prepared to die. Paul said in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer that I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Jesus says you need to do that daily. Daily. You know why? Because there are some days in my life, in my past, where I have put the cross on. And I've died to myself and I've given God everything. <laughs> and then the next day comes and I jump off the cross and try to run to the throne of my life. Jesus says this mentality needs to be something that every day we wake up, we see the grandeur of all that God has given us, and we are reminded of all of this is because his son died for my sins. And I bow myself, I check my ego, and I pick up my cross. I say, Lord, what are your plans for my day? What are your plans for my day? You say, oh, that's awful. Let me tell you something. Being dead has some advantages. <laughs> what? That's weird. Being dead has some advantages. You know, you can't really bother a dead person. Did you know that? Try this sometimes. Go down to a funeral home. Martinetta's brother let you do this, okay? You can go back in the back, back there, where they, you can go sit up with the dead, as Jerry Clyer used to say, and uh, you can go back in the back, and let me just tell you what you do. Go in there, up to one of those things, and 
look over in one of those caskets and compliment that guy. Man, you look good today. That color, that suit looks good on you. You know what? He's not going to be impressed. It's not going to bother him at all. Try criticizing. Man, you show your breath stinks, you know? That tie is awful. That looks terrible. Compliments, criticisms, they don't bother him. Try to bribe him. Here, man, here's 100 bucks if you'll say something good about me. Try to tempt him. Hey, man, I got something here. You want to take a shot? None of that phases him. Why? Because when you are dead, you are dead to self. Flattery, criticism, money, temptation, all of those things are gone. And that is the same mentality. When I put on my cross, when I wake up the day and say, Lord, where's my cross? I have some positives that come to my life because criticism doesn't stick, flattery doesn't stick, nothing gets in the way of what I want to do. And then there's one last page to the homework, and that is, and follow me. That's at the end of verse 23. And follow me. Obey 100% of the time. <laughs> what, what does follow me mean? Here's the word. Submit to me. Look for what I'd like to say to you today. In your daily devotion, when you're reading your Bible, when you're going through those things, you will read through them quickly. I do one. I do Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I love Spurgeon, okay? Read through those things. Do all those things. Listen, when God speaks to you, say, Lord, I want to submit to your way, to your plan. Submission is laying down excuses. I want to follow you. Doing God's will. Now, Jesus doesn't leave this laying there. So he's talked about the exam. Then he says, look, there's going to be homework after it. But then he explains it. The explanation. That's number three. The explanation. Look at the second. It says, the way that you live reveals the profits that you prefer. Think, let that sink in. In other words, what I would prefer to get out of life is illustrated in the way that I live my life. Verse 24. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Jesus is not talking about losing your life like a soldier would. He's not talking about that. That is, that is not it. He is talking about losing your life. Have you ever gotten so immersed in something that you kind of lost track of time or you lost track of anything going on around you? Maybe you were watching a ball game or maybe you were you know, fishing or you were looking through those dresses or you're on a Belk website. My goodness, I think I got a direct line from Belk into my house, Okay. I don't know how they've done it, but they've run fiber optics to my house. Anyway, the, the, I'm, bring it back, bring it back, come back with me, okay? To lose yourself is not to lose your life like that. It is to lose yourself like that. That I, here's, here's the way, what is the great obsession of a believer? It is the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom of God. That is the obsession. And what makes a kingdom? You got to have one thing to have a kingdom. A king. You got to have a king. That's Jesus. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first, doesn't say a kingdom, doesn't say the kingdom, it says his kingdom. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. He says his because it's his kingdom. And there are two aspects to the kingdom of God. There is the present kingdom, the kingdom of every day that we wake up in. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but, righteous, but is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So that is living a believer's life. We have this present kingdom that we live in. But we both know there's another kingdom coming. We pray that kingdom come. Luke 26, Jesus talks about the coming glory of the Father and the angels. He's talking about the second coming. And in the second coming, he will literally, you need to come on Wednesday nights now. We've, we've been doing this. It's been some wonderful stuff. On Wednesday nights, we're studying about the Revelation. And we know that at the end of the Great Tribulation, Jesus is going to come back to earth, put his foot down on earth, and start a millennial kingdom here on earth. He's going to restore Eden here where we can enjoy it. Do you want to be a part of that? 
What a dumb question, right? Of course, I do. Well, guess what? You need to lose your life in the kingdom of now to be a part of the kingdom of then. That's what Jesus is saying. You ever known somebody that studied eschatology, the study of the future, the, the, the study of the end times and all those things, and they're so lost in it they don't live in this one? <laughs> Every person has a choice. You have a choice. You can go for it now and lose it forever, or you can seek his kingdom now and gain everything forever. He's not asking you to be a martyr today. That's not what he's talking about, to lose your life, that we march you. Now, it might happen that way. I heard a story of an old plantation many years ago in the Old South. It came up on this, this, one day this master was out riding around, and one of his slaves, boy, he was just happy. He was singing, and he was having this great time laughing. And he wrote me, and he said, what do you got so happy to be about? You down there working in the mud and the muck for me? What do you got to be happy about? He says, man, I got a Savior in my heart. Jesus has saved my soul. I'm on my way to heaven. I, he put a song in my heart. He said, well, how did I get what you got? He says, you need to get down off your horse in your Sunday best and get down here in this mud and help me. He says, I'll never do that. But every time he went by that old guy, he was out there singing. It, it irked on him. And he rode back up on him a couple weeks later and said, man, how did I get what you got? He said, I told you what you need to do. He says, I just can't do that. Unbeknownst, one day he looked up, and the master comes riding up to him. He jumps off his horse. He says, I'm ready. He says, I've got to have what you have. I'm so empty inside. And the guy says, okay, that's wonderful. The only thing is, you don't have to do it. You had to only be willing to do it. That's what he means to check our ego at the door. We don't know what God's going to ask of us, but we've got to be willing to give him everything. James Cowart went on a missionary trip to the to the cannibals in the Fiji Islands many years ago. The captain of the ship warned him. He says, you go on that island, you're asking for trouble. You're going to lose your life and the life of everybody that you take from him. And he looked at him, he says, Captain, he said, we died before we came here. We died before we came here. Would you give yourself to something greater than yourself? And Jesus asked that question. The whole discussion brings it right down to this one thing, and you've heard this verse all of your life. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and he loses or forfeits himself? He uses this huge exaggeration. Jesus says, suppose by some means, by some ways, by some discovery, by some invention, by some magic potion, you were to get everything. I mean, you get everything. Everything is yours. Every square inch of land, every house, every shed, every trailer, every barn, everything. Every camper, every tent, every car, every truck, every big truck, every one of them. The ones that bend in the middle and go, Shh, every one of them is yours. All the planes of the air, everything is yours. The department stores, everything is yours. M&Ms have your initials on them. The world is yours. And you take your soul for granted. Jesus says, what kind of prophet is that? You know what Jesus says? You're the walking dead. You're okay as long as this life lives. But when it's over, in the skip of a heart, there's an eternity. I would ask you if you owned everything and when that beat didn't come in your heart, do you think that man would give it all back? I'd say he would. To gain everything would mean to be bankrupt forever. Jesus says, get your cross and come on. That's what he's saying to us this morning. Get your cross and come on. There are no casual crosses. You know you can't half carry a cross. You got to carry it or you don't carry it. You put it on or you don't. Salvation isn't a thing that, that, that you buy. It is a free gift of God. But this hallmark's a different matter, isn't it? Florence Nightingale, she was raised in great wealth and prominence and privilege in England. That one where her heart was. At the age of 17, 
she went to serve in the, as a, the bloody Crimean War as a nurse there. As a matter of fact, she, she is called the founder of modern nursing because of that. And she did many great things over her life, and she was the first female awarded with the British Order of Merit. And she wrote this. She says, that I am at 30 years of age, the age at which Christ began his mission. Now no more childish things, no more vain things. That was her mentality. But late in her life, she was asked to explain things, and she says this about her life. I can only give one explanation in all of this. I have kept nothing back from God. Ooh, it's a probing question, isn't it? Some of you are holding back on God on a very elementary level. You just never have answered the question correctly. Who do you think Jesus is? You need to be saved today. You need to get this right. But others of us have answered that question, but we, it's a lot of lip service in it. Our life doesn't follow it. And finally, there's some folks here saved, but we're not living like we're dead. <laughs> Remember, death has some advantages, right? Where are you today? What's God saying to you? What are you holding back? Let's pray together, okay? Father, I know <laughs> there is no way that you're not convicting someone right here today, Lord. Well, I know you are because you're convicting me. But how many days I get up and live my life, I jump up on my throne and dictate my day instead of picking up my cross with a straight-ahead glare waiting for you to give me instructions. God, I pray today for somebody that's not saved that you would speak to their heart, that they would recognize the need to cry out, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. But I also pray for us as Christians who take this lightly. And God, burn in our mentality what it meant to pick up a cross. It meant death. It means that we, we, we don't we don't become a martyr, but we give ourselves totally to you. Lord, thank you for this word today. It was strong, but it was needed. And Lord, I pray that we'll follow you now. Right now, Lord, we'll do what you ask. God bless us because we have been hurt with conviction. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand up, guys. We're going to sing.